probably the best experience you can have is when you're skating for fish because it's unlike trout you don't want to hit it you want to just let them in essence hang themselves and i find the same is true with even a swung fly just patience they'll hang themselves those hooks modern hooks are so sharp that was tim gelinas digging into the swing the click and paul the feel of bc steel and trout spay today on the wet fly swing fly fishing show Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thank you for stopping by the show. Please click that subscribe button and you'll get notified if you are brand new to the show. You'll get updated when that new episode comes live after this one. Today's episode is presented by Deddy Flies, established in 1928. Deddy Flies is the oldest family-run fly shop in the country, now in their 94th season. Deddy's mission has always been to supply the fly fishing community with the finest products and services. Every fly they tie is either tied in-house or by a handful of select domestic tires. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash Deddy to grab your flies right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash D-E. T-T-E. You support this podcast and the oldest fly shop in the country by clicking that link. We are also presented today by Trestle. Trestle designs, engineers, and manufactures industry-leading outdoor products and premium apparel. From their game-changing telescopic fly rod carry and their specialized waterproof cases and fly boxes to their magnetic nipper system that's revolutionizing how people snip their line. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash trestle to get started right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash T-R-X-S-T-L-E. Trestle, thanks for your support. Tim Gelinas, founder of Farlex Reels, takes us on the why behind the Click and Paul Reel and his story of designing his own his own reel company. We dig into the Hardy Perfect and a bunch of other contemporary and classic reels that impacted his journey and and many others uh, out there. This is uh, this is a pretty good behind the scenes on a uh, kind of a cool engineered design of of what it takes and why the Click and Paul is something that you should be checking out. Definitely have another reel to add to my satchel today. So without further ado, here is Tim Gelinas from farlexreels.com. How's it going, Tim? Going great. How are you this morning? Great, great. Thanks for putting this together. We're going to dig into a little bit on uh, some more on reels today and and the Click and Paul reel. Uh, it, it, we could talk a little more about that, uh, what that is a little bit. But maybe you could just start us off before we get into the reels you make, which are these kind of beautiful uh, reels with the focus on, I'm not sure if they're all focused on steelhead Atlantic salmon, but we're going to touch on that. Um, but before we go there, talk about how you first got into fly fishing, then we'll get there. You know, I started out in, uh, grew up in Montana, learning to fish. I grew up about a mile and a half from the Flathead River, and I would ride my bike down there and fish for trout. And it was kind of my lone adventure as my dad wasn't a fisherman. Uh, I had an older brother that was, but a uh, little too old uh, to be allowed into his network. And um, bought my first fly rod at about 15 years old and uh, Fluger Medallist and a Fluger Graphite fly rod and uh, had no idea how I was how spoiled I was growing up in Montana with uh, superb trout fishing. And then uh, post high school, I left uh, Montana at the age of 23. So had a few years there, but uh, ultimately ended up in the Seattle area and uh, to pursue a tech career. And uh, oddly enough, when I started fishing in Washington, I was so disappointed with the uh, the trout fishing on uh, this side of the Cascades that I had to find some other type of fishing to do and ultimately caught my, oddly enough, fishing for red sides on the Deschutes caught my uh, first steelhead, not intentionally, but on a uh, five weight sage fly rod with, uh, with a hare's ear, a flashback hare's ear. And uh, this fish uh, 
ran me all around, as you can imagine, knowing Steelhead. And uh, <clears throat> ultimately, after about 10 minutes, bent the hook out and uh, left me wanting for more. And that's kind of where I started in the, the late 90s, pursuing Steelhead, <clears throat> not knowing anything at the time other than considering myself a reasonably good uh, trout fisherman. And um, went back to Washington, bought a uh, Sage uh, 8100 XP for pursuing steelhead, uh, got set up with a proper uh, fly line for a single hand rod. My first day out on the Snoqualmie River, I hooked into three steelhead, all which were, you know, so this was uh, late September. and. I guess in one respect, I just got lucky because <laughs> that was just insane how good it was. I mean, I was like three hot fish. The third one I actually managed to land, and that one ran me all over the pool. And as you can say, I was dead hooked on uh, on steelhead from that point forward. And therein started my obsession of steelheading. And it wasn't... But maybe a year later that uh, I fortunately gave up the single hand rod in favor for my first experience with a spay rod. And uh, I had broke my 8100 three times on various uh, screw ups, never have never having thrown weighted flies before with a single hander, as you know, is a painful experience you know, backed in a weighted fly into it one time, another time just lifted on what I thought was a hookup, was a stone, <laughs> bro broke it, and just all kinds of uh, fun stuff. And uh, consequently, I was out one time on the, uh, fishing the uh, Snoqualmie near Carnation and, and near the Tolt Confluence, and there's a guy, River Run Anglers, Aaron Reimer. He used to run, he'd do a spay clinic every weekend. I had no idea. In fact, I just stepped into the run up top expecting I was going to fish through the spot I'd done before. And there were 10 other people there um, swatting the water with the spay rods. And I was kind of like, what the hell's going on here? And he was gracious enough and introduced me to the spay rod. And uh, that's where it all started from there. That's it. And that was in the early 2000s? Yes, the early aughts. And uh, funny enough, you know, of course, buying a spay rod, then you need the reel and you get the appropriate size of reel to balance it out. And I started with, uh, you know, hook, line and sinker into buying the marketing hype on, oh, you got to have a drag that'll stop a truck, which... Uh, Turned out to all be horse <laughs> So I bought, oh, I probably ended up owning about 15 different drag reels, you know, like uh, Bowers, some Ables, uh, Loop Classics. And as I fished over the next, I don't know, five years, I would have various problems with reels. You know, they would, either the, the reel would, free spool because the drag was too loose or it'd be too tight because it got cold or yeah. you're fishing in the winter and uh you'd break the fish off and on a whim i bought some hardy perfect reels and uh boulets and to my shock and surprise my catch rate went way up with a click and pull and I really couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. Why is this? And it dawned on me that whenever I had my drag set on a drag reel proper, it was set just tight enough where it wouldn't free spool on a hard hookup or a hard running fish, but not so tight it would stop the fish. And furthermore, if you did need to slow it down, you could engage, you know, with your your index finger on the spool face. Mm -hmm. I typically hold my reel in the palm of my hand yeah, and just rub it down if you need to. And because fishing is such a tactile experience, 
having a click and pull screaming and being able to gauge my hand in the process of fighting fish was so much more pleasurable. It's like, I couldn't believe how much better it was and how different it was, especially when you've been swinging flies for hours and get no feedback at, at all. And then you get a grab and go and it's just uh game yeah. on kind of thing. And that's, uh, that's right. That's where my obsession with uh, click and Paul reels started. <laughs> and that's when you got into, you know, that obsession became creating your own reels, building your own reels. I, I want to stop there for a moment. And this is great stuff. Uh, go back. You mentioned, I'm always interested in this because the, the medallist or the medalist, uh, is that the correct pronunciation? It's actually medallist or is that not a critical thing? I'm just curious. You know, I don't think it's critical. You know, I've heard it both ways, the medallist, the medallist. Uh, it's kind of like the the hardy salmon marquee, you know, how many ways yeah. have you heard people say that? Yeah, they're, they're okay. <laughs> so that's one thing. So the other thing is you're hitting on, you know, for somebody who's never used one of these reels, and I've used um, I've used a lot of different reels. You know, my example is I've used a lot of different reels that had issues with the drags in, in, you know, in the past, right? So I got really comfortable with using my hand as well, you know, kind of palming it or kind of, you know, controlling it, doing that stuff. So um, I know what that's about. It sounds like, talk about for somebody who hasn't used a click and Paul reel, describe it first of all. So you're in a run, you've got this reel in, let's just take it to a run where you talk about a hookup with a steelhead or maybe a fish that's playing and, and describe what that's like with it and how that's different from say using a whatever, like you said, other reels that have a full drag. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the way I would describe it, predominantly a drag reel, most of them are either silent in that they have tension on the line when something grabs, uh, in essence, a braking mechanism and or a light clicker. So you don't get as much audible feedback from a drag reel typically. So oftentimes, I think the reel I had gravitated toward on the drag reel was Bauer reels. And... Of course, they were just quiet as could be. You know, you'd get a grab and it was just more of a pull. The difference I would say describing a hookup with a steelhead on a click and pull, there's predominantly three types. You know, there's just a stop, like a soft, really, the fish just picked it up. They don't pull any line off the reel or anything. And obviously, the worst thing you can do is pick up on the rod. And then uh, the second one is you get this click, 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 you know, and just a little bit of lines mm -hmm. coming off the reel. And then the third one's obviously the grab and go. And there's no question about it. I'm literally grabbing a reel right now. So this would be like this slow, something like this. Oh, there's a fish, there's a fish. Yeah. And then they then they go. Or you get this one where it's just right away and they're they're gone. Yeah. Um and that really that really wakes you up out of your uh, your trance, <laughs> your zen trance of uh, <laughs> right. swinging flies. Right, right. Well, one of the issues with the click and paw, I guess, is that if you're out there you're um you're one of those people where there's a few people on the river. You, you don't want somebody to know you have a fish on. They're going to know you have a fish on, right? Well, I don't really think of that. Ideally, I go back to my tagline for Farlex is going to great places. Mm -hmm. And to me, me, that means ideally you're in some place where there's nobody else around. Right. Or as I say, the sound is for me, nobody else. Right. So your reels <laughs> aren't really made for the person necessarily uh fishing like combat fishing well not even combat where, where you got a lot of people on the river and there's a lot going on well i wouldn't yeah no definitely not you should be away from people ideally uh when you're fishing you're you're out experiencing nature in its truest sense i guess that's a preference i mean who who likes to be around a bunch of people fishing yeah well i think of the the examples of you know, obviously, if you're going up to, well, and maybe this, maybe you could talk more about this because I haven't been up to Canada for a little while up on the steelhead runs, but I know things are getting more pressure. But, um, you know, I, I remember, you know, going up there and there being some people around. I know there's rivers around, especially if you get near the cities, plenty of places that, you know, the fish are there. 
and if you want to hook a fish and then you can take it to the extreme level of like salmon river in new york places like that right where it's super super tight and they just have you know there's one big river so you know not that that's cruel obviously everybody wants to get away but sometimes i think some people maybe can't right and then but it's not cruel right. you could still you could still use your reel and just make a lot of noise if you wanted to right yeah yeah well and as i always say the sound is for the individual because it's it's intoxicating when you get a hot fish on and, and the reel screaming. Yeah. You know, I kind of in my mind's so eye like to put myself back pre industrial age when these reels were made. There were no cars, there were no planes flying around, and there were more salmon caught on click and pull reels than any other reel ever. Were those the first reels? Were the click and pull? Were, was it when they were fishing back in the day? You're talking about here. Was there an actual similar drag style reel they were using for Atlantic salmon or whatever then? Well, think about it. Hardy was really the first manufacturers in the 1800s in England, where all those Atlantic salmon were being caught. From an American standpoint, I would say Edward von Hoff was the first premium fly reel with the drag and then he started making those in the late 1800s but they were predominantly used in the u.s market they didn't really go overseas and if i had to say if i sex appeal i think the baum hoff reels are the the most amazing looking reels but the hardys have all the great sound and if i were to pick a sound you know, it'd be like a 1912 perfect, 1906 check or 1896 check. One of those three is just super awesome. And that's one of the things I try to copy with the sound in my reels mm. uh, as I developed them. So basically, you your reels sound a lot like the 1912, like pretty close. Is that, I mean, how do you get to that point? How do you, how do you get your sound to sound the same with the new reel? Well, I found... There's about three things that really make up um, a sound on a reel. And it's almost like being a luthier on a reel as opposed to a guitar. The metals change the sound. Surprisingly, you can have everything the same. The check gear, the spring, and the pawl could be identical from reel to reel. And you put some brass on it, totally changes the sound. Like a brass foot or a brass faceplate. It's stunning just how much the sound can change from one reel to the other with uh, just some variations in the metal or how it's set up, you know, like a reel with a single handle versus a counterbalance will sound different. Right. And yours, do you have a mix uh, on your reels of kind of the counterbalance or a single, a lot of variation there? Absolutely. And that's uh, all optional when somebody orders it. The other thing I did different with my design was I always was fascinated with multiplying reels. And uh, one of the reels, early Hardy reels I, I loved was a Hardy Silex multiplier. And uh, I researched them and Farlow reels. In fact, the name Farlex is a a mashup of the far and farlow and the lex and silex that's where farlex comes from gotcha. so when i designed my first plate wine reel i designed it so you could order it as a multiplier or a direct drive and for those that don't know a multiplier just is faster wind up so in my case two to one on the wind up hmm. which is super great for a couple of scenarios when oh, you gotcha. get that fish that comes at you. Yeah. So this would be like, Tim, the, uh, you know, basically you reel once around 360 degrees and then you're actually getting the line is actually reeling at 2x, almost like if you're using a large arbor type reel. Correct. Yeah. The difference I would say is from a casting standpoint, I don't like the large arbor reels that get too big around because they affect the cast because they kind of stick out too far uh so if you're doing like snake rolls or even double space it, it wants to put some torque unnaturally and that's why i prefer a more compact reel but with the combination of multiplier you can get that quick 
yep. line pickup. So I started there where you could order either a direct drive or a multiplier. And then ultimately I did an S handle kind of to a throwback to a, a Von Hoff look. And uh, that could be ordered either way. And uh, I now make, you know, my three and three quarter design is a fully integrated cage, like a Hardy Perfect, whether you get it as an S handle or a plate wind. And then I make a true raised pillar in a four inch, which is ideal for uh, longer spay rods to 14 to 16 foot. Are these, I'm just curious on the, because some people probably listening here maybe aren't steelhead fishermen. A lot of people are, but are these reels or these types of reel, the click and pull, are people using these for other species or is it just steelhead Atlantic salmon? Yes, there are some people that pursue king salmon with my reels and I do that as well. Although I, I would say by standard, not many people pursue king salmon with a with a spay rod to begin with what about trout no trout yet although i i have many uh requests for a trout spay which i'm on my fourth prototype fyi <laughs> right now so you guys so the trout spay is something yeah because obviously trout spay there's a lot of situations where the click and paul type reel would be cool and and i mean again take us back to the advantage of, of the let's say you know you're talking about a few of the things the sound the feeling i mean what is the advantage if you take if we're just saying steelhead or atlantic salmon give us the advantages of the click and paul over over just the normal type of reel somebody would use like with the drag you know i think using the word advantage is probably inappropriate yeah i would say what i like to say is preference it's more prevalent, it's almost like a like a bamboo rod. Like somebody might be, just because they love the feel of a bamboo rod, they might just be like, okay, this is the rod I want to fish. That sort of thing. Yeah. Or uh, another example might be the difference between hunting for a deer with a rifle versus a longbow. Right. The difference in experience is you're essentially pursuing the same game but you're doing it totally different where I often watch guys with drag reels. They hook up a fish and they're just kind of got their rod pulled up high. The rods bent. The fish is just not moving. There's no excitement in it there. Yeah. It's just seems like, Oh, well, when I used to do that, I could just as well hand it to somebody else and have the, have them reel the fish up. So what I find with a hookup on uh, steelhead or salmon for that matter, you're letting the fish have their head. Steelhead don't typically go out of this, the pool. In fact, I've probably had less than 10 fish that have left the pool. And when I say something like that, I mean, you can be in a big long run where you'll get 150 yards would be an extremely long run for a steelhead. And the rare occasion it goes beyond that is minuscule. You know, I've caught fish on the Dean, the Babine, the Bulkley, all the uh, the great uh, Skeena tributaries. And, uh, you know, that's where you're going to find the meanest steelhead in the world. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I've never found a fish that can't be tamed with a click and pull reel just fine. Yeah. And... What I find is you're engaged with it, where with a drag reel, you're not. That's the primary difference. Right. So you're engaged with it. So if that fish is going on you, it's running, and just screaming out down the run, you're going to slow it down with your hands, basically kind of palming, you know, palmering it or whatever. Or, or how would you do that? Maybe describe it. If that fish does take a big run, what are you doing with your reel? Well, in my case, so I always recommend people – because you're on a spay rod, I just basically, with my top hand, pull the rod into my gut. And then, in my case, I reel left. The reel is in the palm of my hand. And with my index and uh, forefinger, I can rub the fish down. And you have an amazing amount of control. You can be very soft or you can be very aggressive. You could go to a full dead stop. 
What do you mean by rub it down? How are you slowing down? Yeah, describe that. Well, the the spool face is exposed, so your index finger and forefinger are right there, and you're just got your finger riding on that spool face. And if you need to apply some pressure, it's very simple. And uh, you can go, as you know, if you rim controlled a fish on a, on a reel, you could do that softly or same thing, palming it or whatever. Yeah, or aggressively as you need. Gotcha. You know, typically, you know, when you're landing a fish, especially if you've got a guide or somebody with a net, you're almost better right when you're going to lift their head up into a net, you know, for the proper dance between yourself and the guide. I just lock down on the spool and lift and uh, you're right in the net. And you do that with a rim controlled reel also. Quick question for you. Have you ever been out and about and passed up a fishing spot because you didn't have your fly rod with you? Maybe you were on a commute. Maybe you were traveling through the city. Maybe you saw a body of water and were like, man, I wish I had my rod. Well, today's sponsor has you covered there. This is like a mix between Tankara and traditional fly fishing. Rare Gear has something you definitely have not seen yet if you're new to this. Uh, it travels small, super small, literally in a pocket of your backpack with the fly always tied on. This fly rod basically packs down quickly and packs up even quicker. You just take the rod and telescope it out. There are no guides. This thing is super smooth and uh, <laughs> you just got to check it out for yourself. Rare Gear has produced a fly rod that is going to add to your quiver. And if you're brand new to the sport, it's a good way to get started. So you can just grab this one and be ready to go. Rare is an Icelandic word meaning cane or pole and sounds like the word unique. Rare, just like the gear they produce. You can head over to raregear.com to get a peek at this unbelievably unique rod and find out what other gear they have going right now. That's Rare, R-E-Y-R, -E gear.com. Check it out right now. You will definitely be surprised. You got to take a look right now. Check out the video. Okay, back to the show. So that gives a little background. So for those people that aren't familiar with it, we understand now what it's about. It's more, it sounds like connecting a little more to the animal, you know, to, you know, like having a connection, being able to control it a little better. And just as opposed to letting your, your drag do all the work where maybe you get disconnected and you, you know, probably potentially lose fish if you have too tight of a drag or too loose of a drag on a drag reel, right? Well, what I find people expect the drag to do the work rather than being in, instantly engaged with the experience. And because fishing is such a tactile experience, the more you can get your senses in, the sound, the clicker making noise, your hands involved, and you're just going to have a more rewarding experience. Yeah. Okay. Now describe it again. Now, so we're digging into some stuff, some higher level stuff, but can you describe, and I'm not even sure your background of, you know, engineering and design and things like that, but describe the internal, like of the click and Paul versus say your normal, let's just take it to say, a, you know, a basic trout reel with a drag or something like that. What is the big difference? Is that easy to describe? Well, yes and no. I mean, it's kind of funny that you mentioned like a trout, a trout reel with a drag, which is the most superfluous thing ever. Yeah. I mean, you think about it. <laughs> That's right. If you think about a trout rod when you're fishing with a dry line or something, how often do you ever get a fish on the reel? You're usually you're stripping it in. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Unless you're in a, some crazy, yeah, you're fishing for Alaskan rainbows or something. Yeah. Well, and then even in that case, you know, you're not necessarily using a reel with a lot of drag like uh, i i bought several reels like the lampson series mm -hmm. for trout i don't know if you remember those reels but oh, they yeah. had a super light drag and then if you go back to like uh, an orvis cfo which oddly they're going to start making those again those ah. are click and pull reel oh they are yeah yeah that's right and the Cortland, remember the old Cortland crown? Remember the Cortland crown too? Is that a click and, that's not a click and Paul though. You know, I don't know that reel. I don't remember that one. 
that was just a super duper basic reel. It definitely clicked, you know, it clicked, but it was a, I think it was a crown two or a crown, a Cortland crown. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, this is sort of the history. This is the cool stuff. Like, I mean, there's so many reels out there and trying to get a feel for, I mean, does it seem to you when you first got into it that there were just literally hundreds or thousands of reels? I mean, how does that compare when you started making your reels versus like today? Well, there are more reels now than when I started making reels. I mean, I made my first reel in 2012 is when I finished it, and that took a long time. So what I would do as I started using click and paws like the Hardy Perfect and Boule, I would write down notes about all the things that drove me crazy. And I go, I wish I could change this about the reel. And there are various... I don't know if you have personal experience with a perfect or boule or something like that, but no, I don't. That's the thing. That's what's cool here is that just getting a feel for, you know, a little bit of feel for that. What does that feel like? And why is, why would somebody want to go with that reel? Well, so the first thing, all the old perfects were all right hand wine reels. Oh, wow. Which, uh, for me, for somebody with a spay rod in my hand, I have my right hand up. I'm doing my cast. When I get a hook up, I leave, well, I leave my right hand on the foregrip when I'm swinging. I don't want to switch, put my left hand up, put my, and then start cranking with my, my right hand. It's like you're using a left hander, left hander's rod. Yeah, exactly. So that was always super annoying with the perfects because the English just made them right hand wide and it was too bad <laughs> that's how it was done yeah so that was obviously annoying so I, so I would fish him and be annoyed with it but I was had enough pleasure and realized oh this is great so obviously the one of the first things I put in my design was something that could be left or right there's other little nuanced things like a way the perfect comes apart which is probably without people knowing about it it's almost pointless to discuss but i insisted on my design having a broached spool so it it basically goes on to a broach so it the spool can't spit off like it can on a perfect to boule if the screw ends up being loose mm-hmm. and um anyhow you know I put a lot of thought in it. Obviously, it takes a considerable amount of thought when you you make something a direct versus a multiplier. And uh, to give you a little background on me, I, I actually had uh, three years of machine shop in high school. And when I got out of high school, I worked for an, an arms company hmm. uh, making rifle barrels and pistol barrels. And uh, it was seasonal work and i only worked there for six months but learned a tremendous amount in uh, producing and machining parts uh, literally by the thousands so when you're in a company like that it's you know it's just one after the other there's no there's no downtime and the company i worked for they basically produce all these barrels through the spring and summer month and then they'd bring them to all these uh shows gun shows and sell their barrels and uh yeah it was good work but ultimately i found a knack for computers in the early 80s and developed a career and went to work in tech and uh, retired from that early having um, done well at a couple startups what is tech i'm curious there Tim. whenever you hear tech it's it could be anything right what was tech for you it was a lot of things well I became a a networking expert. I literally networked every computer known to man at that time. And there used to be a lot more computer protocols than there are now. The internet protocol is really ultimately where the company I worked for made, made our money. But that's what I became an expert at was if you wanted to network computers together, I was your man. Oh, right. You were the man. So basically connecting. Uh, so that's cool. Yeah. So I've, I've done work for, you know, Boeing and Weyerhaeuser and Nintendo, all these big companies that had complex networks with 
you know, thousands of computers, which ultimately led to developing software, early internet software. It's been, you know, God, 1994. Oh, wow. The first company I worked for sold off with a brand name uh, internet product. Is some of this stuff like uh, like non-disclosure stuff? You can't really talk about the stuff, you know, the companies and... Oh, no, I can talk about it. It's just probably boring to nobody yeah. that really <laughs> know about computer protocols, you know, right, to right. go through a, a computer stack and, you know, how, how a web browser uses a name to resolve an IP address to a domain name server. Nobody is going to know what you're talking about. It's interesting. I know that's that's the struggle for me is that it is interesting for me. And I know you're right. Most people probably don't care about it. So maybe we'll have to keep that for a conversation on the side uh, (laughs) at a later point. But uh, well, I think perhaps noteworthy is the fact that having cut my teeth on uh, computers and machining, uh, when I started developing my reels, I did all my work, my design inside of CAD programs. Mm. Uh, so having the computer experience was a definite benefit because oftentimes you're working through iterations that you think you've got something right and you design it and then you go machine it and then you try to put it in practice and you still have it wrong. Huh. Just like I'm currently, I'm I'm now on my fourth uh, prototype of my trout spade, right? Which I don't, I purposely don't show to people until I I feel I've got it right. Until you nail it, yeah. What does that describe that a little bit, Tim? What, what does that look like? So you got obviously it sounds like you your reels are pretty dialed in uh, for what you have for steelhead, but talk about that process. So now you get a trout spade. I would think that you just like, well, here's a trout spade. Let's just make it smaller. Talk about that process. How are you struggling to get it right, and then how do you get it right? Well, so part of it is collecting information from people, and as you know, the trout space space is rather new, and in fact. I'd love to hear a good podcast on trout spay because I, I hear so many variabilities on it. For example, there are guys down uh, like on the Klamath fishing for those half pounders and they're, they're swinging flies for them. But typical trout fishing, if you're using a trout spay, which I have never done, by the way, I would assume that you're dead drifting a dry fly. So your spay cast is going to be totally different. Right. Right. You might be putting the line out, but you're not going to be swinging it tight to the fly. It just would screw up a dead drift. Yeah, those are good. I mean, I always think of it as like trout spay is just literally, it's just like steelhead. It's just you're going for a smaller species. Like the half pounders is a good example because these are tiny little you know, smaller steelhead, essentially, right? Under 20 inches and they're like trout, but you're swinging just like you would a steelhead. They're just smaller fish. And actually those fish actually hammer the fly pretty hard, like a normal full-size adult. Yeah, I agree with that. But if you're over in Montana fishing for trout on the Yellowstone and you're throwing a hopper or something. So I've heard everything from doing that to nymphing to swinging with a trout spay. Right. And I have to imagine those. It, all of it, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to get educated on it. And I've gotten so many examples of variation on it that it's hard to get my head around. We'll put together a show for you, Tim. I'll get one together. I'll, I'll check back with you on that. Yeah, and I assume you're going to have to talk to people like, uh, you know, uh, Whitney Gould, who guides over in Montana, or, you know, Travis Johnson or, or Marty Shepard, whoever's pursuing it, but they're a guarantee of they're going to have different methods they use based on where they are. So consequently, as I'm designing this trout spay, I've tried to get input from people and there are people fishing trout spay that they call two and three weights and, you know, four and five weights. That seems to be the spectrum, but you take something that's a true well, two and three trout spay, I guess maybe that's kind of like a four or five weight single hand rod. So one of the problems is getting 
the weight right. So you obviously, you're not going to take a trout spay and throw a 12 ounce reel on it. So from what I've gathered so far, people are looking for some reel that weighs anything from four to eight ounces. Well, that's a huge difference. So I'm trying to come up with something that I can model that's reasonably close enough that you could use it in any any direction. For example, if you used a trout spay bamboo rod, that thing's going to want eight ounces of reel to really balance it out proper. And maybe, you know, some people don't care about it, but if you're not familiar with casting a spay rod, it makes a difference in in how well your cast works and how much stress, surprisingly enough, just lifting a rod that's not in balance, that's tip heavy all day, it wears on you. And maybe it won't necessarily with a trout spay, but that's one of the examples. And the other thing I get, which is interesting, I would say it's almost half and half. And I've probably talked to a hundred people about this. A lot of guys like a clicker reel for trout. And then a lot of people want a silent reel because they want to pursue something. You know, you might look back at an old uh, Vom Hoff reel or a Bogdan, that, which had the poacher's knob on it. And you could turn turn the clicker off. So that's one of the things I've looked at is being able to turn the check off. So it's something I haven't done with my my steelhead reels. Uh, so it's going to be different for sure for the trout spay market. And, you know, to do something up price, if you will, up market, I've got to do something unique and classic. Because there's probably 200 trout reels on the market that would suffice as a trout spay mark reel. Right. I mean, think about it. Just put your medallist on. Yep. You've got a trout spay reel. Right. Anything. You know? Yeah, exactly. And you could you can go to Cabela's and buy a fly rod with a reel and a line on it for under a hundred bucks. It's insane. But it's not going to look like your reel with the the S, you know, kind of all the tweaks that that old traditional style. Yeah, exactly. You know, so you've got that end of the spectrum that people can get into a market with pretty much no expense. I think that's part of what it comes down to as much as maybe we don't like to say it. I mean, you know, having cool looking gear is, you know, I look at these colored reels, right? All these, all these brands that, you know, they have all these crazy colors and able, right? Of course, when they had their, those first reels, but I mean, your reel looks cool and unique and traditional. And I think somebody would probably buy that over some other reel because, you know, I'm doing trout spay. I want to have a sweet reel that not only functions really, you know, perfectly, but also looks like a throwback, you know, like I would imagine that's part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there were, I find predominantly guys that are pursuing steelhead are generally getting on the water because they want to be out in nature. And they're catching a fish is a bonus, but it certainly makes the day better when you do. And uh, therefore, they want that whole experience to be better. So what are you taking out with you? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, I mean, just like fishing with a bamboo rod can yield a different experience for you. Right. Well, I'd imagine if I was, yeah, using a bamboo rod for, for steelhead, um, I would want to have a classic reel, you know what I mean? Like something like yours or a hardy or something. So this is good. So I, I think we've dug into a little bit here, Tim. Um, you know, you mentioned a few reels. Maybe we could just run down a few of those, the Click and Paul type reels, maybe the brands over the years. Can you give us a little rundown? Have you talked about most of the big ones? Or are there any other ones we want to add to this list of things that, you know, some of these classic reels? Well, I would say I'm drawn to my two favorite reel makers being Hardy and being Edward Vom Hoff reels. Mm-hmm. And they're in the case of Edward von Hoff, I mean, that company went out of business post world war two, unfortunately, oh. but they were just stunningly gorgeous S handles. And he made everything from 
trout clicker, small. If you can buy them nowadays. Oh, so he had them. So could you take a look at that reel and say, well, I guess that was a different day, right? Bamboo rods and things, but your, your trout spay might be similar to something like that. Yes, exactly. Similar, but different. I don't, I look at a lot of reels and there are guys out there that do knockoffs. And I guess I always like to put some of my own design in my product. And I would say it's the difference between having my own band or being a cover band. Right, right. Yeah. I don't want to make a knockoff. Yeah, you're not a cover band. You're not singing those Led Zeppelin songs at the uh, at the local uh, pub. Yeah, with a wig on. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> Although that's awesome. Although you go to those things and one yeah. of those cover bands nails Zeppelin, you're like, oh my God, that's Jimmy Page. This is amazing. That is good, but that's not really where you're coming from. Exactly. So whenever I'm looking at something, I like look at Balmhoff and I love the styling. And in fact, if you look on my website, my four and a quarter inch uh, spay reel is a is modeled after the Tobique of Edward Baum Hoff reel. It's it's ebonite side plates, which is hard rubber uh, with nickel silver rims and S handle and pillars. But I don't have a drag on it. It's click and pull. It does have a button on the back that you can push in uh, because they're fixed plates. So you can push that button in to act as kind of the equivalent to your finger on a on a, my four inch or three and three quarter, if that makes sense. Oh, you mean you push a button and it actually gives it a little more resistance? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Put some drag on the reel. You can see that in my on my uh, spay pay, or on my website. Okay, and we'll put a link to all the all your stuff here uh, in the show notes and. And so you got Hardy, uh, Von Hot. What, what other, any other brands? I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of other ones, but when you think of that old Click and Paul or maybe either some of the past good reels or some that are currently other companies, are there any contemporary brands out there now that are doing a similar thing that, like you're doing? Well, I'll go back a little bit first. So Dingley is another reel manufacturer of the past that was amazing. In fact, Dingley worked for Hardy for a number of years and then he went out on his own. And they're terrific click and pauls. Farlow was another company. And then as far as contemporary companies that make click and paul reels, Joe Sarcion, Sarcion Reels. Oh, yeah. yeah. He makes drag reels and click and pauls. And then uh William Olson, Olson Reels, he makes click and paul reels as well. Mark Schomburg or Schomburg Reels. You know, and then there's there's literally guys all over the world making, you know, uh, uh, Chris Henshaw out of the UK makes, well, they're essentially Hardy Perfects knockoffs, uh, like 1912 uh, versions of it. He does a beautiful job. And then um, Wayne Petrovan up in BC, or no, he's in Ontario somewhere. That's another guy that makes some really wonderful click and Paul reels. And there's many more, but those are the ones that kind of come top of mind. Yeah. That's cool. So yeah, it's not a, yeah, if you're not in the, in this uh, little uh, network, you might not even realize it, but yeah, there, there's a number of great brands. It sounds like that are doing similar stuff to you. And I mean, when you look at the, a lot of the reels, are they all, do they have that similar old, old school kind of great cool looking style is that all similar you know it depends on who's making it you know if uh for example if you looked at chris henshaw reels they're all essentially a plate wine perfect uh so he doesn't do an s handle like i do and all those reels are direct drive so i happen to make a multiplier in both my reel stylings and you know i'm always looking at doing something different and unique. I actually prefer to be doing a new design all the time. And I find myself having to get reels out more than I get to work on new stuff. But I guess that's the nature of the beast. Yeah, that's right. Are, are you doing also, you know, obviously we talked about a lot of the Star With Atlantic Salmon. Do you still get quite a few people 
Uh, is that a market you're trying to kind of target those folks out there that are still doing that? You know, I sell some reels to Europe. The biggest difficulty over there is their value added tax is so high. It's like for them to buy a reel, it's minimum 20% and 35, depending on what country it goes to. So that's a, yeah, that's quite a heft uh, add on to the value added tax. And it depends on the country it goes to, but I do sell reels over there to the UK, Norway, Sweden, uh, Russia, Mm -hmm. you name it. You know, I've, Germany, I've got customers over there, but I would say predominantly America and uh, Canada is where my customer base is. Yeah, exactly. And, and kind of, uh, and especially, uh, like Western focused or, or are you kind of spread it all over the country? Uh, no, I'm pretty, pretty good. You know, it, it used to be like I first started making my reels. It was predominantly West coast, but I have just as many East Coast, uh, Midwest customers now as I do West West Coast. And I do sell and, and make a lot of reels for Canadian customers as well. Lake Lady Rods builds distinctive custom rods, each created one at a time to the exact specifications for each angler. Custom built to be the most sensitive tool an angler could ask for, Lake Lady only uses top of the line products and components i can definitely uh test to this rod i've got a lake lady rod and it is super clean and unique from the guides all the way up the rod it's uh components like i said there are awesome it's got a couple of finishing touches that you won't see on other on other rods out there um and all the way down to the gunmetal reel seat this thing is clean you got to check it out you got to give chris a call he's got some good stuff going on here and the rod i've got a nine foot four weight and it cast really smooth. I just threw on a, uh, actually threw on an old five weight I had at the time, and uh, and the thing shoots out some lines. So go over and uh, give Chris a call right now. Lake Lady also restores, rebuilds, and builds bamboo rods from scratch. I want you to connect with the Lake Lady Passion and Promise right now. You will get the most unique custom rod you have seen this year. Check it out. Check out Chris right now. Lake Lady Rods. That's wetflyswing.com slash Lake Lady. That's L-A-K-E-L-A-D-Y, Lake Lady Rods. You support this podcast by clicking over to say hi to Chris. Okay, let's get back to the show. Let's take it out of here. Just, uh, I, I like to start this off just with a little kind of tips and tricks sort of thing. On, and I'm thinking about BC, so it sounds like you try to go up there. Are you getting up there like at least a, a time or two a year sort of thing? Yeah, well, I try to. Of course, we just we're still in lockdown mode in Canada, unless you're a trucker, I guess. Oh right. But uh, yeah, bad joke, I suppose. <laughs> right. <laughs> I made it up uh, this past fall. Of course, it was difficult. With uh, traveling was not too horrible, but it was a little bit more onerous in that you had to have your pre-check COVID and. Every place I went, you had to have the the card, the vaccine card to go in a restaurant or a hotel. Right. And then the fishing was pretty tough this year. You know, I went up for right. uh, 10 days and got five fish to hand, which is, you know. Better than none. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so not typical for up there, no. but uh, I don't know what to make of it. But having not gone for two years, I was just like, I got to go anyhow. Yeah, you're happy to get up, happy to get. And are you are you focusing on hitting a few different rivers or are you just kind of hitting one area? It depends where I'm going. So if I'm if I head up for summer fishing, I'm definitely going to the Dean. Uh now I haven't been back to the Dean since 2014 was the last year I was there, but usually in the fall I've been going to BC for 15 years. Probably the Babine is my favorite river. Yeah. Uh, the Bulkley, I love. The Bulkley's a little bit bigger. I, I find it to be an ideal river size. Uh, but the the fish and the babine tend to be a little bit more in numbers, typically, and uh, larger fish. Yeah. Are you guys like doing the going into the cabins there? Like, don't they drop you in there with like a? How do you get or do that sort of thing? 
Yes. Well, if you're fishing the Bulkley, it's actually roadable in a lot of ways. So you can fly to Smithers and right, you can literally from the town walk down to the Bulkley and start fishing. It's it's that close. Now, ideally, you, you're getting out from there, but there's a lot of uh, river on the Bulkley that you can road to and fish just fine. And then if you do go into the Babine, yeah, you're going to be at a lodge. There's three lodges on the Babine, Nor Lakes, the Babine Steelhead Lodge, and then the Silver Hilton. And the top one, Nor Lakes, they, they boat from the weir down a few miles, and then the other two are helicoptered in. On helicopter, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so you, you're in for a week once you've uh, gone to that river. Yeah, you're in there. That's right. That's right. Nice. Right now, well, uh, yeah. Before we take it out of here, Jamie, I mean, I know we we touched on this, you know, skim the surface on a lot of this. Anything else you want to shed light on on what you have going as far as you know your reels or you know, I know we didn't hit it all today, but uh, anything we any high level stuff we missed today? Well, I wouldn't call it high level. If you look at my site, you know, I do make a uh, purpose built like a brassy, I call it, for um, to make a heavier reel for bamboo spay rods, you know, that are 11 to 12 feet, they like a little more weight to balance them out. You know, you're, nobody really wants to take a bamboo rod and, and put some contemporary drag reel on it that weighs five ounces. It just doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. It's all wrong. And, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of customization for people. I get calls where I'll make a four inch reel that weighs up to as much as 22 ounces. Hmm. So, you know, it's, I'll put brass in the reel to, to weight it up. And I like doing stuff like that because, you know, it's, you're not, you're not a typical manufacturer where you get what comes in the box. So every, every, every reel I make is literally, customer orders it and picks things out kind of like buying a custom spay rod from Berkheimer or miser or, or yep. somebody like that where you you're the custom yeah yeah you're getting involved with the process and you know typically people know more about the experience at that point i don't generally expect a noob to buy my product but you would also say the same is true about buying some expensive spay rod. You know, it's like probably the worst thing you could do is go spend twelve hundred dollars on a Burkheimer spay Before rod. You cast. Yeah, because what yeah. you know what's going to happen? They're going to break it the first freaking day. Yeah. Although his trout rod, right, and I had I had carry on in a recent episode, and we talked about the process and. Yeah, it was similar to you. I mean, he definitely does the custom stuff, but he also has, you know, I mean, he has a limitation, right? He can only make so many rods, and it seems like you're kind of the same way, right? You can only make so many reels per year. You're, you're, you don't necessarily, you feel that. I mean, it seems like trout space is a new market for you, but do you feel like, you know, if if you had too many people asking for new reels, you might be over, or low, you you might not be able to deliver on that. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the balances I try to make. I don't like being over three months out and I've been as much as six before and I really don't like keeping people waiting that long, but I do work on my own. You know, I don't have any employees and Mm -hmm. I don't really have a desire to do that again, to have employees, you know, it's besides, I mean, you, you talk to Carrie, it's hard to find people that want to do, work with their hands that can't go get a job making more money at a coffee shop. You know, it's like, Oh, you know, sand grips or whatever you, you can't pay anything for it, you know? Yeah. And that's uh, that's a good point. If he hires somebody like myself, that's got computer experience and machining experience, well, I'm worth a lot more hour. What are they? You're going to find somebody with that. You're going to be paying them, you know, 50, 60 bucks an hour. Right. And then you got to make more reels. You got to make yeah, more exactly. reels to make up for it. Yeah. And I don't do it because of that. My best part about my job is getting to know my customers. 
I love to hear their fishing stories and I get pictures, I get videos. And most of the time I, well, I don't share them unless I ask their permission and I'll put up a picture or something, but it's, it's tremendous, you know, to, to kind of educate and uh, feel their experience and uh, be involved with it that way. It's very rewarding in that regard. It's almost uh, cheapens it if I, somebody just orders directly off my website what they can do, and I'll build them a reel, and I just tell them it'll be there in whatever my time window is, and never talk to them or never, you know, mm-hmm. just build the reel and ship it out and never hear from them. But right, so you're talking to all your, you're trying to talk to everybody who's buying the reel from you. Most of the time, because guys have questions, you know, it's like, well, I'm fishing a miser that's 11 foot seven. What kind of weight do I need? Most people don't know that, you know, so they're, they're looking for a little help and, you know, I, they could, there, there's probably four reels in my product line that would work for them, but there's some that are going to be more appropriately. And if, you know, the last thing I'm going to do, if a guy calls me and says, uh, I'm not going to, if he's never heard of a multiplier, I'm not going to recommend one. You know, he's never had that experience. Not to say that it, it couldn't come up, but, you know, it's a different experience. So I get guys that call me that that's all they do is fish, click, and pause. So and they know exactly what they want. They know what the experience is like. And then I get other guys that have never owned one before. So it's a it's a little bit of education in one hand and the other hand it's fine tuning. That's perfect. No, I love that. Nice. Uh, well, let's uh, like I mentioned, we had a couple of things here. Just uh, the two twenty two. We haven't done this in a little while, but kind of tips uh, and flies. I'm just curious, and you know, you're on a steelhead run up on the uh, the bulkley, or let's just take it to the babine. What's your one steelhead fly you're you're putting on there? My favorite steelhead fly is a hobo spay by Charles Saint Pierre. And that's my go-to fly in a variety of colors. Um, it, it swings more like an unweighted fly, even though it's on a Waddington number one. But it's lightly dressed, and it's got a stinger-style hook on it. And that's just been deadly for me. Yeah, perfect. Nice, thin little fly yeah. little noodle in the noodle in the water, yeah. Yeah, if I had to go for like a classic fly, it'd be, you know, something like a Mahoney's. I love that fly. I fish that. Or even a a blue charm. I'll fish a blue charm. And then uh, skaters, skaters, of course. I love to skate flies. And yeah, the variety of them. Like the Todd Hirano's fly, I love. Yeah, yeah, Hirano. I was just, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we had Todd on a while back and... Yeah, that's right. You know that that crew, that extreme crew that only is uh, does a lot of the surface stuff, right? Do you, when you're out there, are you kind of trying to split it? Are you doing like 50-50 kind of wet flies versus on the surface? If the conditions are optimal, I love to skate. In fact, I'd rather be on a floating line, either with a wet or a skater. But even last year at BC, two of my five fish were on skaters. And, you know, when the water dirtied up, you, you kind of go off the skater, um, <clears throat> which it did, but I love skating. In fact, I've threatened to one of these years, I'm going to only skate the entire week and just stay with it. Yeah, that's right. Only have a handful of flies. The beautiful thing about a skater, you're never going to lose that fly unless you break a fish off or you put it in a tree or something. Exactly. You can swing that till the cows come home. Yeah. Now, so on the water, let's give us a tip here. So if we're, we've got one of your reels on, we've got the click and Paul, we're, we're kind of in that run. We feel like there's a fish there. What, what sort of tip would you give somebody or, or would you tell somebody to help them, you know, hook up, get a hook up there? Well, if they're, if they're swinging a wet fly, like my favorite, the hobo spay, just cover the water with a, a tight line and, you know this, depending on the current, um, yeah. if it's a little bit dead on the inside, you're going to have to 
literally like kind of swing it in toward the bank to really swing it all the way in to cover it effectively Just to the bank. Yeah. And then if you're using something like a skater, you may not be able to get into that inside without getting a good belly in the line to, to wake it over. And, you know, as you know, there's a lot of nuances to learning how to do that. Right. Yep. I mean, I often, you see the same thing. Guys will step right into the water and go out way too far and be literally walking down the ditch where the fish are lying. Right. And you're just like kind of waiting for them to, to get out of the way. <laughs> so you can go through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nice. Take us out here on with the, I always like to dig in a little more if somebody wants to take this conversation further and learn about maybe it's the history of these click and Paul reels. Where would you send them if they want to learn a little bit about, are there any other resources out there where people can understand, maybe dig more into this topic, some stuff we didn't cover today? That could be a website, book, you know, whatever, videos, I, I don't know. I literally have volumes of books, <clears throat> you know. Oh, you from, do. <clears throat> yeah, so there's no one thing, you know, if you looked at, the Hardy Brothers books, you know, it's a 700 page book. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Dingley's uh, uh, D is for Dingley is another book. Mm -hmm. But there are so many great resources on YouTube. You can look up, even if you look at my YouTube channel, I've got, oh gosh, probably 50 videos of me on fish uh, with the click and Paul. Perfect. We'll put some fish porn videos in the uh, in the show notes as well, so people can <laughs> get a feel, get a listen to what your reels sound like. Yeah, and you'll see a really super hot fish, and you know, I've even got one or a couple of them up there where I'm getting fish on a skater, you know, with the video camera running, and I wear basically a contour roam. It's kind of like a bullet cam version of a here, a you know, a GoPro. GoPro. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have to have it on your helmet or hat or yep. chest or whatever. So it's out of the way. But So where is it? Where is the camera? I have it mounted on a head strap. So it's right underneath my hat. Oh, underneath your hat. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And then when I get a hookup, I just hit the button and start recording. But I've got hundreds of videos, most of which I don't post anyhow. But there's plenty up there to, to see what I'm doing and Fish from the Babine, the Bulkley, the Dean, John Day, Clearwater, you name it, Grand Ron. Yeah, so a little bit of variety there. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Well, take us out here. What, what else do we need to know today before we, uh, before we leave you here? Anything else you want to add? The one other thing I would add about swinging for flies, I think probably one of the worst mistakes I see people do is they lift on fish. And probably the best experience you can have is when you're skating for fish, because if it, it, it's unlike trout, you don't want to hit it. You want to just let them, in essence, hang themselves. And I find the same is true with even a swung fly. Just patience. They'll hang themselves. Those hooks, modern hooks are so sharp. For example, my wet flies, I use like an owner hook. Mm -hmm. You can't breathe on that thing without getting hooked. Right. Think about what a fish is doing, and you don't want to pull it away from them. Yeah. Let them grab it and go. Let them grab it and go. That's a great tip. That's a great tip. Yeah, the lifting is especially for somebody new or even people that, you know, sometimes you do that. Yeah, you want to lift. But so what you're saying is you never lift. Once that, even if that fish is touching it, whatever, you're just leaving your rod in the water or down pointing it at the fish. Absolutely. Just leave it and let them hang themselves because probably the, the toughest hookup is the hang down one, right? Yeah, it is. How long are you hanging it down? How long are you letting it hang there at the end of the run swing? Not super long, but what I mean by hang down take is you don't know which direction they've come from. And oftentimes if they've come up the edge of the river to grab that fly and you, you lift on it, you just pulled it out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, they, because they're most likely were sitting there on that soft edge of the water, four feet from the bank. 
<laughs> you know, yep. and just just kind of were more curious. They weren't. A, it's rarely a real aggressive take on the hand down. Just let them have it. So I don't dally too long on the hang down. I'd say five seconds or so. You know, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not just letting my line directly downstream for, you know, a half a minute or something. No. You know, I've tried it before, you know, doing some short strips. I've heard guys that have had success. I've never caught a steelhead on a strip fly ever. I know. I don't think I have either. I've, I've occasionally I'll do it out there, but yeah, it just seems like letting it hang. Yeah. I, I know what you're saying. So, uh, well, some guy to talk to would be like Al Burr. Cause he talks about doing it with a strip fly, but I've never had oh, any success. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I've been trying to track down Al Burr. If anybody knows how to, how to get him on, uh, definitely let me know, but uh, yeah, I'd love to get Al on <laughs> some of these, yeah, some of these one. people. Yeah. Some of the folks out there are a little bit more challenging, but, uh, but this has been good, Tim. I think I feel like we've uh, we've dug into it a little bit, and I'll send everybody out to farlexreels.com if they have questions. Um, yeah, and thanks for everything, taking the time today to shed some light on. I think you know somebody who doesn't know what a click it never has either never heard of a click it Paul or knows a little bit about it has a better idea, you know, kind of what you bring and what it's about. So thanks for taking the time today. Great. All right. Have a great day. So there you go. If you are interested in checking out the show notes, anything we talked about today, checking out one of those perfects or anything like that, or some of the random stuff we talked about, wetflyswing.com slash 302. 302 will get you the show notes, the links, and everything else. Please subscribe to this episode, wetflyswing.com slash subscribe, and that'll give you a quick little place to connect to all your apps, and you can subscribe to whatever you're listening to right now. And you definitely want to be subscribed next, uh, this Thursday, I believe, Russ Miller is going to be breaking down the Umqua story and some back into uh, kind of Euro and tight line. But the Umqua story is a funny one, is a great one, and Russ does a good job breaking it all down. So uh, check that out. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get off to the next one, uh, which uh, I'm not even sure what we got next, but I know, I know the Russ Miller is coming, and then after that I'm not sure. But I want to thank you for uh, the listen today and hope to connect with you on the water, and maybe online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.